recording. So I'm going to go section by section and talk about what I find there. And I'll try to alert you to page numbers of the Rojewitz um, translation as I quote from him. So this is section one. In the beginning of the book, Husserl works at defining nature as such. Nature is not simply another spatio-temporal reality. It's an object, but is more like, quote, an idea of the essence of possible experience within the totality of what counts as spatial and temporal. Nature is best characterized as the correlation of the act of consciousness. The consciousness, and this is a quote at the top of page four, pertaining to natural scientific experience. And that consciousness seizes upon space and time as the field of objects. Thus, nature is a sort of noema within the natural scientific attitude, and that that's going to be what we're aiming at. So my preference is to see the epoche as operative, but I'm not sure I could prove that. That's why I'm going to talk about the noema. The second section, Husserl decides then to look first at the, quote, thematic attitude of the natural scientist's experience of nature. This is on page four at the bottom. This attitude takes positions on the reality of things insofar as they are taken as separate from consciousness. Thus, the attitude Husserl considers, theoretical, is, quote, doxic theoretic. This is page four at the bottom. Nature is there. It sits as real, as actual, as separate, and thus I can locate nature, pursue it, intend it, only as cleaving myself off from it. Quote, nature is there for the theoretical subject, bottom of page four. To engage in theory, then, is to take full part in the assumption that what is real is what is not consciousness, what is other than it. Section three. The theoretical attitude, which is a clarification of the natural scientific attitude, is different from the valuing attitude that Koshi was talking about or the practical attitude. We may abstract from the relationship to consciousness in perceiving and aiming at values or choices, but this abstraction is different in kind from the way in which we perform or carry out theorizing for the sake of knowledge. And there's page five is a quote there. What is characteristic of it, the theoretical attitude, lies in the manner in which such lived experiences are performed or carried out in the function of knowledge, end quote. It's page five. So Husserl talks about the different ways in which we might be conscious of the blue sky. The doxic theoretical way in which we are conscious of the blue sky is the way in which we formulate the judgment of it as explicit. We form a sentence like, the sky is blue, such that we objectify the sky and separate it out as the thing in itself to be predicated of. To know is to attribute objecthood to the sky and to predicate blueness within it. To have had the lived experience of delight in the blue sky, for example, is, on the other hand, to have remained within the embeddedness of the sky, within the feeling of the delight. I'm on section four. To theorize is thus, as Husserl says in section four, to be objectifying, this is a quote in the middle of page six, in the specific sense of the term, grasping and positing as a being an objectivity of the respective sense. To do this kind of grasping as a being, however, is to have the object already in view, already pre-given. And Daniel, this is where I take your question to have risen from these sections. This pre-givenness is lost in the natural attitude, as the focus of the natural theoretical attitude is not to pay attention to all of the ways in which the object is pre-given. For the phenomenologist, though, what is important is rather to see how the object can, this is page seven at the top, quote, emerge out of the phase of pre-theoretical constitution into the theoretical. What is pre-given as pre-theoretical can also become, however, what is pre-given as theoretical, since the way that theorizing brings objects together and predicates of them is such that it retroactively indicates them to consciousness as always already apparent. This is a quote from page seven at the bottom. The categorical objectivities constituted in the precedent theoretical acts are pre-givennesses. Euclid, for example, does not invent geometry, but reveals it as always already governing even if his historical life was the one that uncovered the very happening of space in its forms. To be pre-given is to be prepared for recognition. It is to be pre-constituted. Constituted does not mean put together by a blind process or act, 
Rather, it means a process or act of meaning formation that is my history of involvement with the object, even what we might say, what I might say, is a prehistory. Husserl also says there is an analogous case when, quote, feeling acts function as preconstitution. This is at the bottom of page seven. Here's an example. I feel irritated at some situation at home or at work. I'm not paying attention to my irritation until it reaches a certain point that arrests my attention. Then the situation comes before me as already marked out by the irritation as having a certain value or look. The feeling was not doing this on its own, to go to Koshi's point, but the feeling was itself a signal of my pre-involvement. The feeling was a language of intentionality that allowed the constitution, the visibility of the situation or the thing to come forward. Husserl talks about how even in the natural scientific attitude in which theory, in a sense, gives us the objects, there is a prehistory to our particular doxic position. This is in the middle of page eight. Objects which for the first time will become theoretical are already in a certain manner laid out there in advance. To be laid out there in advance means that I have a history with the object beneath my self-awareness a motivation to theorize about this or that. Even if we admit, as Husserl suggests, that constitution of the sense of an object can happen by choice or spontaneously, this does not mean that the act creates the object ex nihilo, for even in the case of theory creating new objects like irrational numbers, such as pi, they appear as pre-given. This is in the middle of page eight. Quote, pre-given objects can themselves spring originally out of theoretical acts. The word for spring there is herstamen, which I find unusual for him to use there. The truths or shapes of geometry appear to spring out of Euclid's method. Yet when they do, they are given as always already true, as pre-given. To have a spontaneity of theory is to be engaged with the retroactive references of experience, which theory itself does not control. Husserl also treats of memory and of sudden ideas on pages eight and nine, but even these, he says, are not originally in a theoretical act. Rather, he says, and this is page nine at the top, quote, we arrive in each case at pre-given objectivities which do not spring from theoretical acts, but are constituted in intentional lived experiences, imparting to them nothing of logical categorial formations. The original center of validity at the end of the first volume of ideas from our last webinar was perception. Here, the original center of constitution is perception and the pre-givenness of things, their appearance as given arises. Experience is such only because of a prehistory of our involvement with things that can never fully come to light. To live in the rapture of the experience of the blue sky, which is genetically first, perhaps, is not to live in the act of predication, this sky is beautifully blue, or in an act of theory. The suddenness by which something comes to givenness to us indicates a longer dwelling with it, a longer process of intertwining. Again, to Koshi's point, emotions then are intentional for Husserl, at least in the experience of valuing, and probably I would say with everything theoretical, we experience feelings that predate an apparently simple cognitive act of discriminating or focusing. Even reasoning involves a kind of emotion of calm centering or detachment. As he's gonna say later on, it involves a feeling of indifference. Husserl speaks on page 11 of axiological intuition, which indicates, and this is in the middle of page 11, that, quote, the most original constitution of value is performed in feelings, gemut, as that pre-theoretical delighting abandon on the part of the feeling ego subject. What is delighting? The experience of, Husserl says on page 11 at the bottom, quote, being in the presence of the object itself in the manner of feelings. The word presence, by the way, I don't think occurs in the German in that sentence, just to let you know. To be in the presence of something, to live in such a way that we feel ourselves with the object itself, and this is, I take what he's implying, is what allows theory to claim us and the object. It's not other than feeling, it's because of a feeling interaction that 
theory can take its hold. It is what allows us the, the connection feelingly with the world and with things. It's what allows us to be more distant from it and yet maintain our connection. If we were not able also to be intimately related, not just theoretically related, if intimacy did not rest as the prehistorical origin of cognition, then we would not be able to realistically maintain to ourselves that our theoretical view of the object could claim it, could reach it, could matter to us. Intimacy, presence, closeness, these sustain different ways of intending the object remotely, emptily, etc. Feeling is also demonstrative of its intentional structure in the way it can be a feeling toward. And here's page 12 in the middle. This is sort of like Heidegger's talk, right? The, the being toward, the feeling toward. In the middle of 12, quote, the fleeting glance can be finally anticipating quite emptily, pre-grasping the beauty as it were, following certain indications, but without actually grasping anything at all. And I take that sentence to mean the kind of feeling toward. If feelings feel toward, then they are also pre-giving the intertwining of more intimate delighting in the sky, let's say. The pre-grasp of the beautiful in an empty striving of feeling is the striving toward the intimate being in the presence of, and thus is the parallel striving to the theoretical, which strives to remove oneself from the presence of the object in such an intimate way, in order to see more of the thing in some other way, as if to remove the presence of oneself with the thing in favor of some non-delighting, non-beautiful content. Not that science isn't beautiful, just that it's not talking about beauty. Busserl says at the bottom of page 12 that the way that theoretical acts are built on other ones allows us to be, quote, directed toward the objectively given and thus to be abandoned, hingegeben, I think, given over to what is objective. This being abandoned or giving over, or even another translation of him gegeben is devoted, or devoted to the merely objective feels different. It feels like a distance both from the object and also from oneself in theory. I am abandoned in the theoretical attitude to the objective as if I no longer know what I am feeling, as if I am no longer in the presence of the thing. And yet this too is a feeling, an attitude, a shift, only in the modalities or matters of feeling and not out of feeling altogether. This is section five now. In section five, Husserl wants to highlight how to separate the different attitudes, theoretical, axiological, practical. For him, we can be sure where we are in one particular attitude when, this is page 13 at the bottom, quote, we live in the acts in question in a privileged for Zuglichen sense. The discussion of this privileged living takes us into the act that determines each attitude as spontaneous. The phenomenological description of each discrete attitude takes its cue from what each spontaneous act that initiates that attitude looks like. We might have several spontaneities, Husserl says on page 14, that overlap each other, but this problem is solved by the fact that each spontaneity has a different origin. Each would arise, and this is in the middle of page 14, with a different phenomenological dignity. A spontaneity that dominated the others would demonstrate internally our greater interest in the object as perceived within that spontaneity. There is no necessity that the theoretical would always serve the axiological or practical, or vice versa. When we are living in a joy, Husserl says, we can turn to the theoretical and make it our primary concern or principal act, the bottom of page 14. Dignity then concerns the direction of our interest and our choice to emphasize or de-emphasize. We could, middle of page 15, quote, let the practical theme go in order to assume the theoretical. The idea of letting go shows that it is something that we do that allows the dignity or principality of the various attitudes to show themselves as discrete and thus to allow the object as perceived within that attitude to show itself in that way. What should be said here, I think, is that the object does not stop coming forward to show itself. Regardless of the attitude, the showing itself, the happening of appearing, is not in our control. The dignity of the attitude, the priority of the way the object can show itself, is something within our purview. But the object does not come because we call, simply. 
Rather, our shift in attitude, though having many reasons for it, is the main reason for our selection of dignity or spontaneity. And yet, how could we shift the attitude and agree to do so without the object already calling for us to do that in our prior, pre-given, prehistorical relationship with it? In section six, Husserl tries to discriminate the theoretical attitudes that are at work in singling out the object and in page 16 at the top, the transition to an imminent perception directed to the act. The main difference, though both are theoretical, is that in the standard theoretical act, the predicates of a feeling of beauty or value are attributed to the object. But in the move to imminent perception, we have a reflection on the act and its relation to the object. We have feelings in their intertwining with the object as, however, originating within subjectivity. When I experience something as beautiful, Husserl says, within a theoretical act, and I am not reflecting on the experience, not remembering it, but instead carving out a sphere of responsibility for the object itself, insofar as, this is in the middle of page 16, quote, it is in the object itself that I find the beauty. In grasping the object as object, then, I find the following, bottom of page 16, quote, I look to the object and find in it, in my changed present theoretical attitude, the correlates of these acts of feeling, namely an objective stratum. A theoretical attitude then is always something I am living within when I talk about objects as objects and not as noamata. Thus, there can be something of the theoretical attitude, quote, implicitly contained already in the feeling attitude, page 17. Insofar as I separate out for my own purposes, the valued or practical object as something I turn toward as if separate from the me within the feeling. In section seven, when we see the theoretical attitude as the very grasp of the object as object, it becomes clear that intentionality in the phenomenological sense as the intimate prehistorical intertwining of subject and object founds the theoretical as such. Any lived experience in its intimacy with the object, any reckoning with transcendence, founds implicitly the possibility of the theoretical. This is on page 18 at the top. Every non-objectivating act allows objectivities to be drawn from itself by means of a shift, a change in attitude. Essentially, therefore, every act is implicitly objectivating at the same time. This means that the theoretical may serve to underlie all lived experiences as a possibility of their future, future of those experiences. And it also means that every lived experience may give birth to new objects of theoretical view from within itself. Husserl describes the genetic account of a child's experiencing scissors for the first time in the fifth Cartesian meditation. When the child first learns the structure and teleology of scissors, what they're for, there is a retroactive and proactive chain of references that allows the child forever after to see scissors as scissors and no longer as this mere thing or this tool. The object gathers to itself the function of cutting and of being held within the holes of each blade from out of the first experience of being taught or learning what scissors are for. Nevertheless, it seems to me that here in this chapter, Husserl is emphasizing that the theoretical lens is prepared by an affective immediate spontaneity of intertwining of subject and object. This immediacy can likewise be prepared by the theoretical, however. You can, I'm, I'm, I'm very weak in my eyesight. Okay, so I put on my glasses and bring the theoretical experience of physics and ophthalmology home to my lived body by seeing through them. In this way, we can see that the two types of intentionality can come to dwell within one another and contribute to the full explication of how the sense of transcendence operates even within the affective, even within the immediate. Section eight, after talking about how the theoretical attitude emerges from or dwells within the other attitudes, Husserl here talks about how there is a limit to the theoretical attitude. There is a limit to the intertwining of the attitudes. This is important because the epoche and the reduction are what we understand to be the bracketing of theory and of science. It is the bracketing of the manner of dignity of the ontological claim that the object is separate from us or that is there as the subject of our predicates. Theory meets its limit then 
And what Husserl says, our founding objects are noamata, it's on page 19 in the middle, quote, which no longer contain anything of such retrospective indications and which are originally grasped or graspable in the most direct theses, calls these primal objects or sense objects. The direct theses then are a kind that must be different from theory in the sense of one among other attitudes. There is nothing implicit in the primal object. Thus, it must not be grasped on its own, either in feeling or in theory. It is an object that supports objectivity in a prehistory with us, but which is not appearing on its own. In enumerating the distinction between categorical and aesthetic synthesis in section 9, Husserl hopes to show how we have the experience of primal or sense objects. The categorical synthesis is the way we bring together the experience of an object as separable for our view, as able in to enter into relationships with other objects as predicable concerning ideas, to Bill's point. To see this as that is to use a categorical synthesis, to say these are scissors, which means that they are a type of tool meant for human hands to cut other things that fit between them of a certain surface and hardness, like paper. But we also have the capacity to perform aesthetic synthesis, syntheses of sense acts. When we perceive a thing, we are led quote, intentionally back on the bottom of page 20, to a set of acts that are not united around a term or a set of terms. The aesthetic synthesis, contrary to the way in which we do categorical synthesis or ideas, is not spontaneous. It is of elements or data that do not appear on their own. These data require that the aesthetic synthesis be continuous, inadequate, and implicitly include more sides, more profiles, more discrete elements, than is immediately in view or in earshot. Everything happens in an aesthetic synthesis as if drawn forward by the yet to be revealed, by the sides unseen, by the data on the surface that is causing us to move across it so as to reach, though not yet, the fullness of, for example, the color as a certain unity or pattern of the surface. These elements, data, demand that the aesthetic synthesis also unify the areas or organs of sense with each other in myself, the touching field and organs with the visualizing field and organs, etc. Neither in the sense thing nor in me do I experience the process of unifying that is aesthetic synthesis. They are active and are experienced as always already unifying themselves and themselves with each other, we can talk about either the data or the sense organs, without my being able to witness the principle or the temporality of their unity. In section 10, Husserl shows that he means by sense objects, primal objects, those that, quote, lie at the ground constitutively understood of all spatial objects. It's page 24 at the top. Such objects are ones we relate to by means of syntheses that precede every thesis. So, if we were to think of Kant, that sounds a lot like Kant, um, but I think what he means here is that it is an embodied way in which these syntheses will precede every thesis. This operation of sensation is the way in which consciousness is predicated on not just a spatial apprehension, but also a sense datum that is not localizable in space, and that is something which is changing continuously, page 24. This sense datum is what Husserl indicates as that of which a lived experience is possible, a lived experience that, quote, pre-gives the spatial tone, page 24 at the bottom. So there's this example of, of uh, when you hear a violin tone, you hear it from where it is, you hear it as spatially uh, constituted. There has to be a um, sense of tone that is um, without that localization. This tone as pre-spatial is also pre-given and precedes the constitution of the object as object. If I'm irritated by a sound outside my window, the irritation precedes my awareness of how far away that sound is and who's doing it. Again, the prehistory of experience rests within a pre-objective involvement with data that is not brought to light, but which undergirds all theoretical attitude spontaneity and all categorical intuition. So Bill, I guess what I would say is that this is the, the prehistory of ideas. 
This logic of prehistory is something Husserl states here. This is on page 25 at the bottom. There must be a tonal sensation, which is neither an apprehension of objects nor a grasping of objects. In the most proper sense, it is not actually pre-giving, but is a consciousness which apprehends precisely already in terms of objects. So the word object as a recognition is not built up by consciousness out of nothing. We are always already intertwined with objects or things that are on the way to objects. And our theoretical discrimination of objects, objectivation, is something that rests on a way of having an object that is indistinguishable from the way of being a subject. We grasp an object, recognize its transcendence over against our imminence, as page 26 at the top, quote, something that is already present to consciousness as an object. The object is thus at its base, a unity, quote, in original time consciousness, page 26 at the bottom, or the condensation of my time around it as around what is to come. An object is given in this primal way through, quote, mere single rayed reception, the bottom of 26. We receive, we tune in, as it were, to the static on the short wave. That's what this aesthetic synthesis I'm saying is and find the channel that is surging toward us by shifting the knob. So constitution is at bottom reception. It's not creation, it's reception. This is section 11. I'll do this section and then we'll break for discussion. If nature is the sphere of mere things or objects in the sense of objectivations is over against us, then it is only insofar as we are theoretical subjects that we could define nature this way. To do this is to limit our intentionality, to perform a kind of epoche that is not phenomenological, as it excludes, quote, all our feeling intentions and all the apperceptions deriving from the intentionality of the feelings. This is page 27 at the bottom. To do that um, would be to prevent us from experiencing all the different things that phenomenology would want. I think his um, contrast here with the epoche is meant to indicate that the epoche is active within this section. Um, our cut into intentionality as theoretical subjects then makes sense, but it is still a cut, a kind of violence that denies the way that theoretical objects begin in an essentially undifferentiated unity of subject and object. To experience, quote, only their stratum of spatiotemporal materiality, this is at page 28 at the top, is to will oneself not to experience a lived body or a lived experience, but rather a mere body, in German, a Körper. There is still a feeling that accompanies this theoretical attitude, Husserl says. It is that of indifference. And there is still a value, namely the value of it is so. The feeling of indifference and this value of the it is so, these point back to the intentional whole W-H-O-L-E, that is the lived experience of the prehistorical and the lived body of the human experiencer. But they do so only in faint echoes that phenomenology works to recover. Husserl says on page 29 that the natural scientific attitude does not annihilate the world of feelings or the whole of the engaged intertwined consciousness. It simply disengages from them and allows us to recognize or constitute objects only, quote, it's page 29 at the bottom, through the doxic objectivating consciousness and not through the valuing one. We do not experience houses in the theoretical attitude. We experience force, mass, inertia, position on a grid, etc. Okay, so that's the first chapter. I'll break for a while, and I we'd all really love to hear from what you have to say, what your thinking is. Go ahead, Olga, yeah. If we don't experience houses, how does the object constancy come around? Um, which I mean is that uh, we experience houses. I think the point about, go ahead. Okay, yeah, no. I think that that's clear, right, Peter? Uh, or uh, let me reformulate. Do Would you say that in the current argument, in the argument that you presented, we have enough means to determine 
the genesis of object constancy or something else needs to come in to be able to understand it. Uh, interesting point. I'm though. having trouble with my, my. Go, go ahead, Bill. I'm just having trouble with, I guess, with my connection because things are a little bit slow and, and garbled, but go ahead. Oh, we can hear you fine. Okay. At least I can. Um, so what I'm, what I'm struck by, and again, it has to do with this question that I had asked originally, is the emphasis that he put on the word feeling, um, fühlig, I guess, or something like that in German. And I really don't know what he means by that, um, but he means um, more than senses, I take it. Um, and so feelings are funny things. I wish we read more discussion about feelings. Um, <clears throat> And um, so what occurs to me is that um, one thing that ideas, again, my New York accent, um, keep um, that um, make possible is that they permit, um, um, again, back to Olga's point, is that feelings are fleeting and, um, and they come and go, but ideas don't. Um, that we have a way of holding on to experiences on part, hold on to feelings. And they also permit, um, as we make these objects, they permit um, the interconnection, the elaboration of feelings. I remember um, studying um, the philosophy of emotions. I can't remember the name of the author now, but um, and he, he emphasized the point that we can create new emotions all the time um, because emotions are um, combinations of um, bodily experiences and ideas. And so anyway, and then the other the last point is because I've been reeling Shaler lately, is that um, he, he um, says something very similar to what Husserl seems to be saying here, is that he believes that emotions are the pointers to values. Bill, and what is it that you are referring to when you say, as Olga said? Because <laughs> well, you were talking about about whether um, what, about the idea that we need to have enduring objects, and e either that or we need an enduring idea of the object, which is somehow coupled to uh, sense data. Right, that, that, that's what I'm saying. That funk that ideas function as, or at least uh, at least one instance. And again, I'm really interested in what's going to happen in the next uh, section because he's going to talk about animals, I think, and because um, we have to somehow or either we're going to change our idea of animals, or we're going to become more animals, or they're going to become less animals. I don't know, but they appear to have worlds just like ours. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I'm interested to see how we're going to talk about animals. I found it very interesting about when he talks about the pre-given and um, I guess the explanation was kind of like the sh it's structurally already given and you kind of like perceive it in the background type of thing but I was wondering does it have to be like passively given or can it be pre-given without being passively already there? Can you say more about a, a possible example that might fit that question? Do you have something? I guess like, I think you said an example about like, if a fan is, I'm not sure if a fan is on or something and you weren't conscious of it, um, it's, you're not conscious of it, but you kind of like feel it in a sense. It's yeah. pre-given. And then when you're conscious of it, it's probably totally given. But I feel like pre-given isn't just things that like are happening in the background, but um, even like our habits or like our, uh, what we're anticipating are also like pre-given. And so I was wondering if it doesn't necessarily have to be 
we don't necessarily have to be conscious of it like passively. So we could be conscious of it actively. Is that what you're asking? Or just unconscious of it? I was thinking maybe it wasn't, we weren't conscious of it at all. Could mm -hmm. that, is that possible? I mean, that that's, I think what I read him as doing here is to problematize that very point that um, we're always already conscious of whatever comes to consciousness. And there must be a the, the, the base point back to which we could go is this sort of passive experience of these primal objects. We can't go back any further. Um, however, another thing that comes up in both in his um, origin of geometry and in Derrida's commentary on that book, right, are that when Euclid discovers geometry, they, they retroactively go back for all time as as though they were all these truths were already there they didn't need us to grasp them they were just always true and it's we who catch up to them um so i think that in the in that push back retroactively how does that come because i think that's that's where you separate out well i didn't have to be conscious of them for them to be true they were always already there I mean, that would get to the kind of constancy that Bill was talking about. I think, though, what Husserl would have to say there, which I can't remember from, it's been a while since I read Origin of Geometry, is that um, our needs to carve out, for example, property lines on bumpy earth has pushed us into a situation of recognizing this. And I would, I would hope he would say something like this, just as... Um, our relationship theoretically or otherwise with objects gets us back to a, a sense of primal object or a sense object that cannot come to visibility. So too does geometry make a similar claim and the ability of geometry, not just to make the claim, but to push itself back to the beginning, right, as it were, like that's borrowed from this particular motor in us of going back to the fan that we can't perceive and then realizing that in some sense we have been related to it all along. He might, Husserl might even say, well, we have been related to space then all along. We just didn't see it the same way. So anyway, I think it's a great question. I think all three of these questions are interrelated. Um, I think Olga, I, I, your question I didn't get because of the, the, the way that my internet was functioning. But I think what I might, what I did here, what I might like to say is that in the theoretical attitude, we don't experience the the house as house. We experience it as a thing that's that's constructed out of certain ideal relationships. Um, and so if we want to experience it as a house or even more as a home, then we have to allow the theoretical attitude and the, the valuing attitude to overlay one another. And through that, we can see both of those things at once. That's how I understand him anyway. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's all that I could get last time. I uh, do we have a minute more for for this discussion, or do we need to move on? I mean, given that there are new people um, and that people seem to be interested, I think we should go on a little bit. Um, but go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I'm going to bring up a big question, and that's uh, I hope Gordon will chime in. Uh, feral children. Um, there were studies on, you know, children who grow up outside of the society or in, in, uh, in some kind of a orchestrated environment or simply circumstantially. Um, I'm not quite familiar with the reports on their development. I know that there were language studies, but I think if, if anybody knows anything on feral children and then like their cognitive development in particular, not just language, uh, that would be interesting to, you know, to bring this research at this point. Um, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> okay. okay, question closed. <laughs> okay. I wish I could be as definitive as Gordon on these questions. Sally. Well, I mean, I'm just listening to all this and processing it. And what went what ran through my mind was that 
isn't he saying, I mean, on the one hand, he's, I mean, phenomenology is about apprehending the, the object of, of what you're directed towards, but he's also totalizing uh, experience, which means to that we have the capacity to accommodate um, these passive um, objects, manifestations, we have the capacity to accommodate that, but yet, right? Phenomenology proper is when you are apprehending, when you are directed towards something and then there's, thus begins the experience. I mean, that's what I'm thinking when I'm listening to all this. I think this is part of the challenging and maybe Daniel would say the ontological character of this discussion. Um, if Husserl is doing the epoche and therefore not playing the game of, you know, trying to elaborate what truly is independently of consciousness or within consciousness, then what is this move towards a prehistorical, um, non-self-aware involvement with the object at the level of data or bother some irritation of the fan, like Miyuki said? Like, this is a big question. And I think it's this is not the only place in Husserl's work where this issue comes up. Like phenomenology is trying to describe things at the periphery that we get a glimpse of on the way to the explicit constitution of objects in their more constant, going to Bill's question, and, and, and uh, reliable, you might say, uh, appearance. He says it this way, and, and Gordon was excited about the transition between solipsism and intersubjectivity. In the, in the fifth Cartesian meditation, Husserl says, you know, it must be the case that the other person as other has performed a transfer of my sense over there where they are, such that I could see them sufficiently similar to me while retaining their own otherness, their own radical alterity to me. And the image I get there is, and I don't mean to presume any faith of anyone, but I, I find this story really helpful when he says these things, because it sounds like it's an a priori argument independent of experience. It must have been this way, even though we can't see it. He says, we will never be able to bring to recognition um, the way or the moment at which this power, in a, in a sense, has been transferred out of us. It's like what I read in the gospel story of the woman who has a hemorrhage who comes up to Jesus and touches him in the midst of a throng of people and and he says who touched me and the disciples are like you're crazy man there's hundreds of people around you you know get over yourself and and Jesus is like no I felt power leave me and then he identifies her and she talks to him whatever but the the feeling of the power leaving I want to mark that out as very similar to what's happening here it's the feeling of the irritation moving into the constitution of the object as constant and as uh, reliably able to be pointed to. That feeling is in effect the, the proof, as it were, that we can talk about these prehistorical notions of experience and not be simply dogmatic, or as you said, Sally, and you, I'm not, you know, I'm not, criticizing it, but it, it would look totalizing, right? It would look totalizing on the part of Husserl. It would look like he could have no way of saying that without actually being able to be cashed out with evidence that is through intuition. And I think what he means to be doing here and what people after him do a lot is that they, like Heidegger and Derrida, they're pointing to something like trace. They're pointing to something that's not quite an experience. It's on the way to an experience. And nevertheless, it has resonances. Even the word resonance might be a, a way of talking about it. And so, like, you don't have to agree with me I, by any means, but that's what more and the more I read him, the more I think he's really trying to um, broaden what phenomenology can do by really paying attention to this toward being toward something on the way to something. Um, and so, I, th that's all I want to say. But I thought, Sally, that was a really helpful way of putting it because I think that's what he's trying to do. Thank you. You could can I just quick last comment? I, 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 I'm honestly just curious. Could it be that he was simply influenced by um, developmental theory by 
Darwinism, which was prevailing in, in, in the science of the time? Um, or would you say it purely comes from the reflective analysis of experience? Or is it some form of theoretical attitude which can be contaminated by biology, developmental biology? I mean, uh, it seems logical, it's coherent with the whole structure of sciences, you know, this supposition, but is it a compliance sense? I, I really, I'm not sure I get what you're saying, but I'll try to, to answer briefly. And, and then we could talk later okay. about it. If I'm, not, if I'm not understanding you or I'm not actually responding. That's okay, I'm just rocking the boat. Yeah, uh, no, so. I, but I, yeah. I think it's a helpful rocking the boat, right? We're, we're like in a shallow pond. It's okay to rock this boat, right? It's not, we're not out in the middle of the stormy sea. Um, you know, I think that it's before all of those distinctions come into place. I think what he really wants phenomenology to be is um, prior to the distinctions that people have already made about ontology, theory, physics, biology, it's how do you describe all of those things? And so for him, um, like what, what he's trying to do is to say, in part, it is biological genetics. Like how did we first learn about scissors? We need to point to the moment when what was a confused perception of an object turned into a clear perception of an object. And we need to do that because we need to understand the experience of retroactively and proactively structuring our experience by means of this one, right? And so it's partly historical, it's partly genetic, it's partly a priori, it's partly a reflective view on the way consciousness always has to function, which makes it seem sometimes, like Sally said, totalizing. And that's what he gets called out for all the time is that he's making these moves that are totalitarian or somehow you know not respecting difference but if you look at what he's actually saying i think and, and this will get us to the next couple of sections you know people love to talk about the normality abnormality discussion as him being dismissive of disabilities or something i don't think that's true at all i think he's just trying to say look if you want to talk about disabilities and normality then what you have to realize is the function of the very uncovering of normality and abnormality in in experience as a whole so i think less much less of him being you know in unaware of people's differences and more of him saying the difference between imminence and transcendence, for example, is what allows experience to continue. Difference and distance and gap, all of those are at the heart of experience. And it's it's not that we have to reckon with difference later, it's that we're always reckoning with difference in the most essential ways. And that's how experience continuously refers to itself and and Un, you know, doesn't undo itself, but promotes itself. Anyway, that's a little bit too much, a little bit too, uh, but but I, I, all of the questions and comments that you all have are what I find to be quite exciting because I do think they push us to see Husserl as this, going back to Gordon's point, this radically original thinker. Um, now, as you can all tell, those of you who've been here and also those of you who are new, like I have a certain take on Husserl. It's that Consciousness is interaction with the object all the way down. And so for Miyuki, it's like whatever point we're talking about, it's not, it's never fully unconscious and it's never simply consciousness on its own through an opening in which the object comes. It's always intertwining all the way down. And so I always read Husserl as Merleau-Ponty in the light of Merleau-Ponty's notion of flesh, the intertwining and the chiasm. This is how I, I, I just see Merleau-Ponty as a natural development of Husserl. And so I'm in a way, if I'm criticized, I could be criticized for reading that back into what we're reading now. And I just want to be honest about that with you because you may not think that way and you may have other things to say about Husserl. I'm not trying to close that off. Anyway, is it okay to go into chapter two? And if we don't get through chapter three, even though, Gordon, you may be disappointed, we can always do that <laughs> next time, right? <laughs> There's plenty of time. Yeah. All right, so chapter two, section 12. 
Osterl begins this new chapter, which focuses as much on the bare non-psyche thing as possible by talking about the striking difference between material and animal nature. The best basic recognition we have of mere things is that they are located in space and time by having a place within a world and within a world time. This being, and I'm at the bottom of page 30, temporally extended, means that each thing has its time or duration and thus a fixed place in the one world time. Spatially, top of page 31, each thing has its place in world space. The experience of each thing is located in both space and time as having its own twofold position relative to other things is important because it allows us to understand how we might experience the identity of something through change and through its shifting relations with other things. Far from identity being something we bring to things, and this goes back to Daniel's point about Descartes, far from being far from identity being something we bring to things, as Descartes maintained with the wax example in his meditations, identity is something we experience as part of the thing's manifestation of its placement. We now proceed with Husserl in section 13 to see how everything that a thing is in other respects, and by essence, this is in the middle of 32, it's a quote, is related to the extension which necessarily belongs to it. So Koshi, this is really a response about value. Everything a thing is, is related to the extension that belongs to it. How do qualities change with the changes in extension of something? This webinar is now unfolding around its second book written by Husserl. How does that change? That unfolding, promote a change in perception of what we are doing, if it does. Also, Husserl asks, how does the rootedness or foundedness of the psychic in the material affect or allow the psychic to show itself. The relation between my psychic life and my body then is the goal of this discussion of material nature. And to get there, we need to appreciate, Husserl argues, that, quote, extension, 32 at the bottom, is not a mere piece of space. Space is a way of location, a network of relationships, a placement. It is not an indifferent medium that can have a whole, H-O-L-E, but rather a set of charged positions of actual and possible interrelationships of meaning. We now understand something about the manner of extension. Contrary to Descartes, extension is not radically other to the res cogito. But even in the merely extended things, we can see that qualities are the very givenness of the thing's identity in its being spread out. Page 33 at the bottom. Every corporeal quality of a thing fills the spatial body, the thing spreads itself out in the quality. The wax, changing as one brings it closer to the fire, is a continuous experience of change of qualities. But each quality, color, shape, hardness, smell, each quality that changes never gives up the way it allows the thing to be seen in its change in extension. The qualities in their relationship to the thing as a whole give the very apprehension of surface, spread, wholeness, and placement. Husserl's specification of the relationship between a material thing and its properties, then, is a way of highlighting how the thing belongs to, or in its placement, how it has or owns its place as its own. This is a kind of phenomenological description of the manner in which each thing is there in person, Leibhaftig, for us in perception. Each quality, he says, page 34 at the bottom, quote, is a ray of the thing's being. So Koshi, each quality is a ray of the thing's being. And is so because extension affords each quality its ability to be that ray. Extension as such then is not another quality, but the very blueprint of the way the thing can have qualities from there, from then, to here and now, to there and in the future. Extension is the manner in which the thing can manifest itself at all, and thus is, extension is, 34 at the bottom, quote, a real determination, but it is a fundamental determination, an essential foundation, and form for all other determinations. The value we take in the house is something to do with the very structure of the house and of what it's come to mean. And what it's come to mean is the way in which it sustains our emotional, moral, and cognitive plugging into it. 
Um, as we can see, this will mean that extension, having a place, is the very possibility also of having a psyche. But that's further out and will depend on articulating what having an orientation or perspective means. Here and now, within the context of material nature, we can see already that the thing has something like an orientation. That's what we usually describe ourselves as having, orientation, right, or a perspective. We're not just in a place. We live in and through that place. Anyway, I'm saying that extension now sounds a lot more like the thing has an orientation in the sense that its extension is a sense of belonging and a zero point of relationships or relativities that the thing manifests as its own. Even here, though, Husserl has in mind articulating the experience of the lived body. So even here, I think Husserl's a little worried. He's like backed himself into a little bit of a corner if the thing's extension is more like a, uh, an orientation. He says, quote, 35 in the middle, do we not sense from the outset a certain difference by virtue of which locality belongs to me somewhat more essentially? So by virtue of describing the thing within its extension as having a kind of orientation, immediately then there's a difference that we need to, to talk about because we perceive it. This is section 14. Live bodies of animals and humans then, Husserl says, are 35 at the bottom, quote, founded realities which presuppose in themselves as their lower stratum material realities. The relationship of foundation is quite important, for in being founded, the lived body is not reduced to the merely extended, but rather it relies on the extended to live through and thus live beyond or transcend the limitations of the extended. So again, difference is at the very heart of the unity, the presence that we have even to ourselves. What is the relationship between psyche and body and the difference is what allows the psyche to both um, live there and to live beyond the body that it is also uh, as Husserl notes in section 14 what it means to live my body to have consciousness as embodied is to have properties that quote have no extension 36 at the top where is my consciousness it is throughout my moving body it is the me that I identify now with myself and my very different body as I age. Didn't have all this, I can tell you, not even, not even 10 years ago. The having no extension of consciousness, the inability of me to pinpoint my mind in my pineal gland, for example, means that there is something fundamentally consistent between the sense of localization of my mere body, Kurper, with my lived body, Leib, and they're coming together. They're coming together, as Husserl notes, is a lived body that is still a body. And I'm not sure if he's the first one to claim this word or not, but the word he uses for our lived body as a whole is one word, Leib Körper. The two words are together. And I haven't read that anywhere else, but it may be that he's not the first one. As founded in extension, then, people and animals are unable to be fragmented in the defining living characteristics of I can or I perceive. We have material bodies, but the relationship of having is itself something greater than the sense of a mere thing having its location. Our sense of having a thingly body is contrasted with what we more essentially are. Having is not being. Yet it would seem having is required for the being of consciousness to occur. And thus our sense of having means both that the location of consciousness and perception is identifiable, the general place of my perceiving, moving, and living is here in and as my body, both identifiable and yet ambiguous. It is nowhere particular, the this, this psyche, but it is the wholeness of my bodily life. Our consciousness thus in community with mere things and their relation to their own qualities, page 36 in the middle, has something like spread, yet not extension in the properly thingly sense. What we thus have in the recognition that our psyche participates in extension is a fundamental problem, as Sally notated earlier, for phenomenological description. What does the relation of foundation, the rootedness of the psychic in the material, mean? To what extent does the thingly character of our body both limit our consciousness and also, at the same time, promote its thingly 
self-transcendence into a non-thingly character. This is what I take closer to be talking about in the whole book. Um, we thus are spatially localized, where what it means to be localized is different from what it means for a thing to be located. We're on section 15 now. In section 15, Husserl asks after the difference between localization and extension. What he wants to do is ask after the meaning of the word, Latin word, res, in res extensa or res cogito. The dialogue with Descartes is thus continuing. Um, the mere thing, the körper, is a pure and simple individual, page 37 at the top. What does it mean to be an object, something that is individuated? That's what he pursues. I'm going to go section by section with the letter numbers. So this is subsection A. We start on the road to a thing as such by beginning with, quote, clear givenness, 37 in the middle, in perception, and then somehow having a continuous connection of perceptions of that thing that then, this is 37 at the bottom, quote, shows in the progression of the perceptions what lies in it, what belongs to its essence. Notice that the thing in its progression of perceptions has agency and will show its essence. The thing has a, quote, page 38 at the top, determinate directive for all further experiences of the object. I've, and I am always arguing for the agency of the thing in Husserl's description. So it's giving us a determinate directive. This means even in the free fiction or free acts of variation on the particular experience of this or that thing, which I can perform myself, that my way from perception to essence thing is a matter of following up what is already announced and required of me. These directives are, quote, 38 in the middle, traced out in advance and are what allows me to get to the essential layers of the thing as thing, 38 at the bottom, quote, only if one lets the answer come from it itself in the actual carrying out of directives. He's trying to get clear on res, on thing. And he is saying that the thing as thing gives me directives by way of which I am able to know more clearly what I take to be the idea thing. So um, this is something to do with Bill's question. The thing answers for itself, leads us from the cave of sensation to the light of reason by means of us following in our freedom what is sketched out in advance. There is, of course, the light of the sun within the light of the fire when we are chained, right? But we need to find out how in the progression upwards, how the light of the fire already has the sun within it. That is, it's not just in its similarity to the sun, it's that the sun created the trees that make the wood, that, right? So the, the sun is in the tree, but we have to figure out how it's in the tree. And this isn't obvious except as running through and following up, making explicit. Um, going back down is another story, which I'll leave for Plato to talk about. The process of allowing the thing in section B to show the essence that resides within it means taking account of the limits within which a thing remains what it is. Motion, change, etc., are relevant here. The conditions under which the sameness of the thing announces itself are part of the continuous possibility of free fiction, free variation, he also calls it. These are the directives, what allows the thing to shift and yet remain the same thing. Husserl's example of looking into a stereoscope is quite important. A stereoscope is like a view master with these two eyes. I don't know if you've ever seen one. They're pretty cool 19th century uh, I think invention of the like you have two images that are moving over one another what we do there is to bring a givenness to bring to givenness a thing by way of merging what might be experienced initially as competing things of sight for both eyes we learn to see according to the law of the stereoscope by quote fitting organizations into corporeal fusion that's page 39 in the middle but the thing we see in that machine is not a material thing. It's more like a phantom, like a rainbow or a blue sky, or even the sun when we perceive them. These are experienced, these things in the stereoscope, as fulfilled spatial bodies, but not as material real. That is the thing, the res, is, quote, still given as more, page 40 in the middle, as more than just an image. The very givenness of a thing as thing, and so the stereoscope is meant to contrast the way that the thing appears. 
Very givenness of a thing as thing, then, is something beyond the experience of a schema, a fulfilled pattern of sense. The deep and sustained sense of the thing as index of multiple acts of sense converging together, this is beyond the experience of the stereoscope and is not always an experience that I have. The red pyramid I see through the stereoscope does not give itself as material, but as phantom. It's given as a mere image, a reference to that which would give itself as a thing if it were to be experienced directly. It is in this sense, then, that the phantom or the image, that's top of page 41, can support materiality as co-apprehended and yet not co-given. I see a picture of my friend. My friend is co-apprehended, but not co-given. When in contrast to the stereoscope, we experience a thing in the usual sense, which has both a visible and a tactile surface, quote 42 at the top, there is an exact analogy between how the thing appears to sight and to touch. This analogy is the very experience of a moment of our freedom, still at the top of 42, quote, a lived experience of transition, Übergangs Erlebnisse, within a continuous apprehension. With a thing in our experience, we sense the very transition of one sense into the other as we go on experiencing the thing. The thing, in other words, organizes us and our seeing and our touching and our self-perception and allows different ways of being an experiencer to dwell together, to move into one another within the ongoing experience of the same thing. The surface is co-seen in its roughness, etc. The senses within an ongoing experience of a material thing allow layers of that thing to appear as co-given and to refer to one another or to recall, he uses the word recall, erinert one another, page 43 at the top. The thing uses the intertwining of my senses then to allow its appearances to develop their own relationships of co-givenness, both spatial and temporal, within its givenness to me as supporting layers that recall each other. The essence of the thing as directing me then is as Körper, a unity of experience, and this is 43 in the middle, that is, quote, an index for a manifold of possible experiences in which the body can come to givenness in ever new ways. This entire discussion of what a Körper is as opposed to a phantom is thus leading up to the way in which we can experience or describe our own lived body as a live Körper. These mutually Referring layers of the material thing then indicate the transcendence of its givenness. It's at the top of page 44. Quote, were the materiality of the thing not to be given actually and properly from elsewhere, then indeed there would be nothing in reference to which the intuition of the schema could have a motivating function. I take this to mean that the sight would not refer to the tactile, the touch would not call us to turn the thing over if the thing were given by us to ourselves, it's from elsewhere. Another way of saying the same, the thinghood of the thing is not given merely in the visibility of it. It is given in the interconnections of the schemas by virtue of which it gives our senses over to one another. An upsurge of references and interrelationships of thing and body. This is the experience of the thing. So section C. The givenness of the thing as thing is also related, Husserl says, to circumstances, the relations the thing bears to other things, to the environment, to the foreground and the background. The light shifts, and so does the thing's visual experience. This is 45 in the middle. Quote, a continuous change of the circumstances entails continuous alteration of the schema. A rough ribbed surface is a property of a thing. This property can come to givenness as objective, as real as of a thing. This unified character of a surface is given as such to our notice because it stands as a product of a prehistory, that of the relationship between schema and circumstances. And these, schema and circumstances, do not typically come to givenness as objects. Quote, this is 46 at the top, what is real of the thing itself is as multiple as it has, in this sense, real properties, ones which are throughout unities with respect to manifolds of schematic regulations in relation to corresponding circumstances. So what we see when we see a thing is a set of interrelationships that are that's local localized there, but which really is our schema, our perceivings, 
uniting together and its relationships to its environment and its other things uniting together in the act of consciousness. I, I enact a unity of myself, a thing enacts a unity of itself in this overarching thing called experience. And experience then is, is all of these interrelationships manifesting their pointing towards one another. It's really not just mine and it's not just the things. Um, so the visibility or the tactility of the thing which draws our power of feeling or seeing across it it helps us remain focused on it and not drop off into the foreground or background, helps us to found the property of the thing and thus the thing itself. Our schemas are interrelated by the thing in two ways, therefore, by virtue of its layers referring to one another and to us, and by its referring to other things and to the environment. So the making of the world comment that Bill made earlier. The awareness or experience of the thing as thing, as object, as real is thus a late development to continue the discussion that Miyuki and I were having. There are interactions happening well beforehand, which also continue afterwards. And it is these interactions, schema, layer, circumstance, that go into the relatively late co-product, the thing and its qualities or properties, as coming to givenness as if on its own. And I want to highlight that as if because I think Kant makes a lot of use out of that when he says, you know, the beautiful object we have to talk about it, even if it is simply a play of the imagination and understanding within the subjectivity of the individual, the uh, rational subject. He, you know, we have to act as if it were a, a quality of the thing, because otherwise we couldn't talk about it. We couldn't point to the experience of the play of the faculties. I think something else, something similar, though not the same, is happening here. We make a mistake that we. In, in in a way it's a mistake, in a way it's a cut or something. We think the thing comes to givenness on its own. We think that we come to givenness to ourselves on our own. But in reality, that's the as if function. And it's useful, like developing science is incredibly useful, but it points back the as if towards a more fundamental intertwining that only appears at best or in part peripherally. So now I'm in section D. The schema, the thing in this light has this appearance, is thus a, this is, I think, pretty cool sentence at the bottom of page 46, a primal manifestation or documentation, beurkundung, I don't think I've ever seen him use that word before, originary manifestation of a real property. So the schema is a primal documentation of a real property. Thus, the schema, the appearance to my sense of sight or touch is, quote, a state of the real substance at that the point in time involved. How does a thing have a place in space and time? Because it manifests relationships that sustain that experience of mine. My schemata, my non-appearing moments of my acts of experience are contributing each moment to the thing's placement in time. As the light shifts and my pupils dilate or contract, I participate in the thing having its duration and its place. Even if neither the light nor my eyes change, the ongoing perception of the thing through my time, through the time of my schema renewing itself, means, quote, this is 47 at the top, that there is again a change in the direction of the regard on the thing itself as the identical substrate of this or that self-manifesting property. My regard develops through the schema either changing or remaining the same. And there is a moment at which the regard is given the thing as thing because of the attention that does not come to givenness, namely the interaction of schema and circumstances. Section E. To experience a thing is to experience it as the identical real something of its real properties, mere rays of its unitary being. What I posit as the identical and same then is a product of a motivated way, 48 in the middle, of my experience coming together through and around the thing. It, the thing, has a kind of echo of my noetic rays of regard. It has rays of properties that shoot out of it toward me. And I have rays of regard that shoot out through the operation of my senses and their schema to its rays. The ray of the property and the ray of the regard match or map onto one another in the continuous and successful 
as it were, experience of the thing. Thus, even though we are uh, talking about the natural attitude, we can still gain a phenomenological clarification on the very way in which the apparently separate thing we posit is in fact a phenomenological unity by way of always already being united with our lived body from before we can ever possibly notice. The thing of scientific nature then is first and foremost the noema of prehistorical interaction and constitution. Now I'm on page, uh, section 16. One more page and a half and we can take a break and talk and then um, decide if we're gonna stay until 2.30 and do the third section or whether we're gonna wait till next time, and do that and, uh, part of the next one. So section E, to experience a thing is to experience it, this is 48 in the middle. No, no, I did that one, sorry, 16, 16. What we posit when we experience the material thing is quote, the overriding unity of the thing page 52 at the top. We notice it as the whole that situates the parts, as the more that its properties or qualities which can each change launch themselves from. The thing is the more that is a temporal unity that can, quote, disperse itself, its duration, into segments, still on page 52. The more that the thing appears as, the more that we recognize and posit as separate might simply be given, Husserl suggests, as the apprehension of an act of the thing's own movement or traversal of its parts. This is page 52 at the bottom. Quote, yet a unity of reality traverses the totality of changes. So in my way of understanding this is that the thing traverses itself. Is this a possible phenomenon? Can we actually experience the thing traversing itself uniting its totality of changes. Assuming it is possible, then this traversal is joined by a kind of perception of mine of that whole in its inadequacy. Quote, the thing never achieves a perfect givenness, page 54 at the top. The thing thus launches rays to meet my view and at the same time traverses and withholds itself. The thing traverses its parts and yet never in traversing gives me the key to see the entirety of its traverse. Because the thing appears as traverse and as inadequacy, Husserl states, the kind of explanation in natural science that a thing is constructed out of molecules and atoms is already pre-delineated as a possibility in the intuitive thing. This is page 54 at the bottom. And I think this is really exciting because he's rooting all scientific explanation in lived experiential terms. So the thing is a unity of sides, of properties, of schemas and circumstances. It is a unity of parts as rays of itself, a unity that does not fully appear in all its connections to its parts. To move from there to atoms and molecules, which can only be seen in a severe distortion of the thing, that is under a really powerful microscope, is not mystery or literature or just some radical choice. To see atoms and molecules, is grounded in the way the unity of the thing appears as such. However, by the same token, the thing is given an intuition and phenomenologically as noema grounds that. The persuasiveness of science rests on the way it implicitly takes over the experience of the thing's unity for us and of our intertwining with it, traversing and responding to its inadequate givenness. And in the way science does all of this as responding to the needs of our own lives. There's a little appendix that he has. He, he talks about some interesting things like frogs in a lake. Like, what are we going to do with that? It's like, there's a thing, water, it's like a medium. And then there's frogs that live in this thing. So you got things living in other things. He says, is a medium like water or air a thing that is experienced objectively? Like within natural science, water or air seem to be more than just a phantom or a circumstance. They seem to be a thing. Yet they are experienced as bodies, as kurpa, but also as having the capacity of a relation of containment for, quote, material things of the first and originally constituted kind, end quote. It's page 57 at the bottom. And what he's doing here, I think, phenomenology is not just, you know, well-organized. He, he starts writing and he thinks about these other things, he had phantoms, and then all of a sudden he's got, oh, and the medium, and he's just trying to make a phenomenological problem for all the possible ways in which things might appear. 
for what might be on the way to things like phantoms or referring to things. These are problems for discussion and description. They're not meant to be, I don't think, a, a whole uh, set of deductive remarks or anything like that. So section 17, Husserl ends this chapter by saying that he has now come upon a phenomenological consideration of substance in relationship to substantial qualities. Those qualities that are determined by circumstances, sight, figure, et cetera, are not substantial. Those that belong to the thing itself within itself are substantial. All right, so we could break for discussion um, of that chapter and then um, make a decision as a group what we want to do. So the floor is open for you. I, I have a question about race. What, how, how should we think about his use of race? Um, there, there used to be in the very early medieval theories of perception, just such a, an assertion that we, in fact, transmit to the object. Uh, that's not been an active principle for a long time. Well, is it merely metaphorical? Uh, is it embedded? Is the word in German used differently than the than the word strikes us in English? I don't know about the German because I'm not that familiar. Um... But I can I can say that it's probably stream or ray strahl as I think what the word would be, um, and I I don't just think it's metaphorical in the sense that um, my regard Peter as person is directed differently. I mean I can say if I turn my head my ray is over you know the ray of my regard changes, but it's also um, not just like light. Like I can be hearing and my, my ray of regard is oriented through hearing or to the touch of the table as I put my hands on it. Um, I was surprised, Gordon, that he used the word ray to talk about qualities because it implies a kind of um, similar structure to the thing, right? Orienting itself out of a center and having different layers that can, can respond. So I think he means it to be dynamic and and parallel in a certain way but i think the word ray just isn't an attempt to name something like a co-authorship of experience and my view of this is that then experience itself as a whole as almost like a a, a, a sphere in which subject and object have their place like it's experience itself that is ontologically primordial and out of that comes subject and object. And what we notice is that we're justified in talking about experience itself as the agential whole because of the similar way in which the object and subject refer to one another. So I bet if you pushed him, uh, he might say that rays are closer to references than they are to anything like contributing reality to something. Um, but I'm not sure about that. Thanks. Sally. Yeah. I can just add the way I see it in my mind is <clears throat> I see rays is sort of like the equivalent of um, energies, but not essence. I mean, I, that just conjures up that image for me. I have to think about the relationship between rays and essence a little bit, but I'm going to think about it. Yeah, one more time. I'm saying for me, I see the rays as energies which em emanate from essence. Right. And I, the, what I need to figure out, and maybe what we could talk about, uh, is whether the essence is within the ray. Um, that that is the, the, the way in which the object shows itself to be valuable is for the value to, uh, you know, which is an essential part of the object to display itself in that in that ray but I'm, I, I have i have yeah. to think about it more maybe other people have, have can can weigh in too or say whatever you'd like you don't have to follow well i'd like to ask about this 
I remember reading this, it was a couple of weeks ago actually, but I was a little bit confused and I thought I sort of understood a little bit better, but it's used to the word schema. Um, so at first I thought it was sort of, sort of like a noema or something, but I think it's more than that. Um, anyway, um, if you could say something more about, because you use the word quite a bit <laughs> um, and you were very comfortable with it. <laughs> Uh, so um, you must have some sense of what he, some examples of what he means by schema. I mean, I think, so you have, you have one experience of my face now, and now you have another one, right? And so I think for me, the schema is the, the way in which my senses have a coherent grasp of a thing in its self-presentation at one moment under one set of circumstances and then they have another one at another moment in another set of circumstances and so like um you know the irritation before focusing on the fan or whatever the 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 schema can shift over time and you can have multiple schemas that contribute to one ongoing perception of one object but i think it's him trying to show how complex and significant the unified experience of one thing across different lighting or or distance or whatever is because we're really uniting kind of pre self-aware states of involvement with the thing so the schema is our pre-experience cashed out in certain ways and they unite with one another hopefully, if we're experiencing the same thing. Um, that's how I understand it. I yeah, don't, so go ahead. That's, um, um, yeah, you, because you didn't, I don't remember you speaking much about the abnormal and the normal. And that's um, what, um, like, like we talk about uh, optimal, he used the word optimal. There are optimal ways in which we perceive things. And then um, and all things are viewed relative to that optimal um, thing. And so there, there's a kind of schema where we, relate these um, like different lightings or um, whether there's something, remember who talks about something over the eyes or something, and we're still able to perceive the same object. And so there's required some sort of schema that enables us to do that. I think sometimes, I, mean, I could be wrong about this bill too, but the way I understand schema sort of outside of phenomenology is sort of like a structure by which I, uh, perceive something so if my schema is you know uh, my perceptual schema is quite limited if i've never been to a museum an art museum and i go i don't quite know what's going on i don't have a schema with which to process what's in front of me but i don't think that's exactly what he means by it and so i think that will really become important when we turn at, at the normality abnormality thing is in this next chapter right so that'll be really important because i think the burnt finger has a very different set of schematic touch interpretations, if you will, from the non-burnt finger on the other hand, which is why it's so important, he says, for the hands to be able to take each other's place. So if this finger's burnt, I'm gonna use this finger on this hand to do it. And so um, I think you're right. I think that's where he's going with this whole thing is to then begin to, to talk about how we constitute larger level or higher level um, differences within experience on the basis of these schema that don't ordinarily come to givenness but which pave the way for those things i think that's that's what i think when, when i hear the term schema and schemata it immediately comes to um, uh, cantonine and uh, purse was took a lot from the schema and the schematism chapter in cantonine he maintains that had Kant come up with it earlier then he would have eliminated this distinction between concepts and intuitions. Um, he particularly wants to criticize Kant for, for not being sufficiently clear about the difference between a concept and a, 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 and a, and a schema. Um, but the way you were describing it there, uh, um, in terms of co-authorship, and also in terms of the um, difference between the schema of a burnt finger and of an ordinary finger, makes it sound as though for Husserl, there's a very intimate connection between a schema and, and a particular perceptual organ which doesn't seem to be there for Kant or for Peirce doesn't think in those particular terms either. Um, and when you were talking about co-authorship, it seems that we have this, this, this goes back to something somebody was asking about earlier about the, 
uh, relationship between objectivity and intersubjectivity in Husserl, I think that we have almost a sort of a community of senses in ourselves. Um, and so the, the object itself is, the, is, um, is um, constituted as, a, as an actual object, something, something non-phantom. By the fact there's an agreement between the different schema of the different um, the different sensible organs. We move up further layers, we'll find that our uh, our different uh, perceptual organs agree with the testimony of other uh, sorts of subjects and so on. Now, of course, there's a big question as to whether there's anything more to the objectivity than the agreement between these different subjects and what have you. But but it, it seemed that there was something particularly original in Husserl there, and it certainly lends weight to your Merleau-Pontian interpretation of Husserl in this regard. The, 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 the intimate connection between the schema and the, and the perceptual organs there, but, but that that's something I thought that I wasn't familiar with from from from, from Kant or indeed from Peirce either. So a, a lot of this stuff is really challenging a lot of my preconceptions about Husserl. Actually, I, I, I find it fascinating. The idea of that, the idea of there being such as Husserl talking about pre-givenness at all. Before reading this, I would have thought, well, <laughs> that's exactly the kind of thing Husserl wants to get away from. But, but as you're talking about these intimations and apprehensions and what have you being legitimate territory for phenomenology, is very, very, very eye-opening indeed. I'm, I'm glad, and you're right, uh, Daniel, and I had I had forgotten to mention this, but Merleau-Ponty was reading ideas too when he wrote Phenomenology of Perception. And this is the material that he, that he took from, by and large. Uh, so that, that's really important. And that's, I had not thought about Kant on the schema either. That's really, that's really helpful. Can I, uh, I mean, uh, Peter, I, I was just wondering when in this uh, section, uh, when Husserl is making this case that no, the extension, uh, as, I mean, unlike Cartesian definition of uh, uh, matter as extended and where extension seems to be the essential uh, property of material bodies, Husserl is making a case that it need not be so, if I understand him correctly, the way extension there could be of, uh, of, of non-material uh, uh, bodies you know when he says medium etc so thereby he's making a case if i understand correctly for consciousness to be embodied you know that that uh, is am i right in uh, reading that way that's what i wanted to know yeah thank you i think you are i mean i, I like that um i think you could approach it that way or another way which is that consciousness cannot be thought of as apart from extension uh, because if extension is considered broadly enough in all of its possibilities, then consciousness has to be thought of extension as rooted in extension, founded in extension, and yet um, its foundedness in extension does not do away with its inability to be fragmented or pointed out or specified like on a grid or even with a finger. Like I can't point at your consciousness. I can point at you and you can always feel like, hey, why are you pointing at me? Right. But but that my pointing does very, very little. Wittgenstein, thank you so much for that. But like it does very, very little for uh, identifying the where of consciousness, except insofar as the visibility of your living out your consciousness through your body gives us some access to it. Um, and then, then if that case, then is there a departure from ID in one in this uh, uh, context where I think one gets the feeling there that you can somehow talk about a pure consciousness which need not be understood in this sense of extension? I mean, I'm just asking. I feel like there is. I really do feel like that that what we're getting here is him be, becoming more aware that that move and in, in ideas one to say that um, you know, everything else could pass away and consciousness would still be able to um, have a life of its own where it's basically thinking about itself and its own moments of, you know, I find that to be very difficult to put together with this new description of consciousness as embodied. I understand why he does it in Ideas One, um, because he really wants to emphasize the way that um, Imminence is so different from transcendence. So for him to say that the imminent experience is immediately given and is absolute being, right? And that any imminent experience is given that way as absolute and as, as any, any reference to transcendence is immediately sort of submerged in that overall character. Um, and he wants to say that's so different from this notion of transcendence, which we we make sense of but which 
relentlessly points outside of consciousness. So I think what he wants to do is simultaneously affirm that distinction, but then say, yeah, but but consciousness is the real thing. Consciousness is the whole. And uh, I think by the time he gets here, I think we we do get a very different sense. And for good reason. I don't I don't think there is any possibility of imminence being separated from transcendence, that, that, that internal differences are what make the whole work. And that thought experiment of considering, oh, what if imminence were all there is? That's, I don't, I personally view it as inconsistent. Um, I don't know. I have never thought about that till you just said this now. So, you know, maybe I'll erase this little piece of my discussion before we post it. I, I, I'm okay being taken to, to, to town for it. But I, I actually think, I like what you're saying, Koshi. Olga, I saw you too. Just wanted to chime in, Koshi. Uh, I liked very much uh, what you said. And um, I think that there is a shift going on between ideas one and ideas two, um, which is also connected with um, switching analysis, so to say, from the horizon of pure thought to the horizon of embodied thought. And um, uh, Husserl, in the context of embodiment, and Peter, correct me if I am wrong, but I, I hope I am not, please. Um, in the context of the embodiment, Husserl is able to find the ego pole. And he starts talking about the self. And he starts talking about the perspectival orientation of uh, constitution. And he starts talking also about the point of zero orientation, which is connected with the ego pole. Uh, so uh, the reason I asked in the beginning about the personalistic attitude uh, is because I saw in the literature that uh, this shift uh, we are disc discussing now is connected with um, Husserl beginning to look at consciousness not just as a a prioristic theoretical subject but as a person. Uh, and when this shift is happening, then it's also the step towards uh, time consciousness towards the analysis of the internal consciousness of internal time. And that starts bringing up uh, problems which are logically irreconcilable, irreconcilable, cannot be reconciled or we the whole this whole narrative or actually they start shaking the reference to the object as the sole source of consciousness. It's like, it feels like some kind of metaphysics of the self has to step in, in order to be able to explain or understand the directionality of consciousness, because uh, consciousness does become perspectival as soon as we uh, start considering the embodied consciousness. And that, you know, it's towards the object and object does tease it out, but it cannot be the substrate of peculiar relationships that uh, consciousness is. And that is also, it's also, it's beginning, this line of thinking is beginning actually in Michel Henry's critique of Kant, the, the ontological critique of Kantian psychology, where he says that before all of this, um, categories and, and sensory intuitions uh, can show up. There should be something which is capable, alive basically, of giving rise to this kind of relationship. And this is a very, very difficult to explain. I'm actually sitting here waiting till people come, Peter comes to that point. <laughs> and it becomes obvious that we cannot really logically think uh, consciousness apart from uh, metaphysics, you know, the metaphysics of the self. So we are, we are just gearing towards that Niagara Fall switching point, I think. Well, so. one, 
I don't disagree with you, Olga, in what you were saying. One thing I will point out to both you and Koshi is that um, in this next section that we read for today, Husserl says very strongly that if God is real and is something that can be understood by hum by anyone, then God needs to have a body. Uh, and so like that right there, right, is, is sort of this idea that any consciousness must be embodied and must itself be participating in a world of transcendence. And therefore, consciousness cannot be separate from, from materiality. Um, be cool, what it means to have a body, though, could be open to many different things. Yeah. But even, even well, okay, I think I should stop here. <laughs> yeah. um, what do you all want to do? Would you like to um, end now and have this third section be part of the next time that we meet? That, that would be my preference, if that's okay. So everybody's basically thinking that. So here's what we'll do. Um, let's uh, let's break off now, but let's read. Let's stick with the reading. Read as much of the second section as you can, and I'll send prior to March seventeenth. I know it's St. Patrick's Day. I hope you can still come. Um, I am Irish, but I don't really celebrate St. Patrick's Day, just because. I don't know. It's, it's just not my thing. But um, please come if you can. If you can't, I would completely understand. But just read the whole thing. And we'll start here with that third section. I just want to say, again, welcome to Miyuki and to Daniel. Thank you so much for joining the group. Um, and Mo, I always want to hear from you. And and I know that you may not uh, have uh, you know the desire, the ability to talk where you are. But anyone who wants to uh, continue the conversation. You have my email address. Please feel free to get in contact with me. I, I really enjoy these meetings, so I'm I'm really grateful. So have a so great. I really day. appreciate it, uh, and I'm just listening, so I'm still learning. And once I think I've have sufficient maturity, hopefully I will contribute as well too. Well, that would be awesome. Is I, I contribute and I have no no maturity whatsoever and don't listen to anything. So you're that would be awesome, Mohammed. Thank you. All right. Well, ha have a great time uh, until the next meeting. So see you soon. Thank you all very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.